I want to thank you, friend, in these days for your good support for us and our ministries. I'm going through a battle with cancer now, had a successful surgery, now in treatment, and it's a hard pull these days. Thank God for His presence and His power. We're praying for a healing, and thank you so much for joining us in that very prayer. We want to serve the Lord as long as we can in this old world under the curse, and the gospel of Jesus Christ is the news the world needs so much. I want to bring it as long as I can. Amen. Thank you. I was talking with my great friend, Chaplain Wayne Salter, one night before preaching in a Florida state prison. Chaplain Salter told me every man that will be in that crowd tonight struggles with a question. Is my salvation forever or can I lose it? He said, Freddie, this is what they argue about here all the time. Whenever a discussion about the Bible or God breaks out, they're going to end that discussion with that question about eternal life. Later that night when I preached to those men, I told them this. A lot of you men have walked this aisle 30 or more times. You've confessed your sin, turned from your sin, walked down, prayed, whatever you were told to pray. You've forsaken everything you knew, tried to start a new life, and right now, having walked down this aisle 30 or more times, you don't know if you're saved into eternal life or not. A great swell of agreement met my statement in that prison that night. There's a lot of confusion. Not only in our prisons, it's in our churches, our vacation Bible schools, and it's out on the street. Am I able to know for certain that I have eternal life, or must it always be a guessing game? Let's talk about this. Most confusion about how long salvation lasts can be solved by understanding what a person needs to do to be saved in the first place. So let's explore this in the Bible today with three Bible characters. Here we go. Number one, Abraham. In Genesis 15, 6, we have this conclusion statement of the Bible that Abraham was saved into eternal life. Now his beginning back in Genesis chapter 12 was not a good one, was it? He was the son of the wrong kind of priest and grew up watching the stars and looking into the heavenly bodies to try and find a God that he didn't know. But God revealed himself to Abraham and Abraham out on that desert floor in Genesis chapter 15, the Bible says, was saved. The Bible says, and he believed in the Lord and he counted it to him for righteousness. Now, let's see our way through the pronouns here. He is Abram. He believed in the Lord. And he, that is the Lord. Abraham believed in the Lord. And he, the Lord, counted it to him, Abram, for righteousness. So this is what Abram found out, the way to be saved, the way to be righteous in God's eyes is not a long, long list of things to do. It's faith in the salvation that God is offering. Now, Abram would have known so little about what was to happen in the pages of your Bible Abraham didn't know what the cross was about. He, he didn't know these things. But he knew the Lord. And he put his faith in the Lord that he knew. And the Lord responded to that faith and counted it as something that mattered. He counted it for righteousness. And on that righteousness that belonged not to Abraham, but to God, hangs the salvation of of Abraham forever. And now someone in the audience might be saying, no, no, Isaac was offered as a sacrifice by Abraham. 
Well, that's true, and it's a wonderful story, but that didn't happen until Genesis chapter 22. That's going to be seven chapters later when Abraham offers his son Isaac in a great display of his love and obedience to God. But that act of faith had nothing to do with the fact that Abraham, seven chapters earlier, had been declared righteous by faith alone in a salvation that he trusted was going to happen because of a future event provided by God. Romans chapter 4 also speaks about Abraham and his faith. Paul the Apostle actually used that Old Testament example to establish the truth that salvation is by receiving the righteousness of God by faith. It's not by providing a righteousness of our own. And this is what I mean in my opening statement, friend, when I said that a lot of confusion about how everlasting eternal life actually is could be solved once we understand what a person must do in order to be saved in the first place. And the Bible is very clear. There's one thing to do. Not two, not six, or 56. There's one thing to do, and it's what Abraham did. He put his faith in the Lord, and the Lord moved. And God counted that faith as righteousness for Abraham, and into his account, he put the righteousness of God by faith alone. That's good. Romans chapter 4 now, Paul the Apostle writes about that faith, and here's what he says. What shall we say then that Abraham our father, as pertaining to the flesh, hath found? What did Abraham Find, Verse 2. For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory, but not before God. Here's the problem. The people that I talk to who think that you can lose your salvation are banking on something besides the righteousness of God that's given to them by faith alone in Jesus. They're banking on some kind of work that they did. But you see, if we have to add our own work to the cross work of Jesus when he said it is finished, then our work would have to continue to be held up. That if we ever stopped working or our work fell short or sin somehow intervened, that we would lose what we had earned. But you see, salvation is not something to be earned. Salvation is a gift to be received by faith. So friend, maybe all your life, maybe all your church life, you've cobbled together this idea that believing in Jesus is not enough, that you needed to glue something to faith in order to be saved. Well, you're going to doubt your salvation because here's the truth. You're just not perfect. You're just not good enough for God, nor am I. This is universally true. We all fall down. And that's why here's a great question. When Abraham twice lied about his wife to heathen kings, does that mean he's no longer saved? Well, of course not. He's saved not because he's going to get everything right in the future. He won't, nor will you and I. He was saved by believing in the Lord. And that salvation stuck because the righteousness of God will get you everlasting life when the righteousness of God has been put into your account. Amen. Verse 4, he says, Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. So friend, it's a tough truth to face, but I hope you will today. If... Maybe all your church life, maybe all your life, you've thought that it's about working that would save you. You're trying to toe the line. You're trying to hold on. You're trying to put God into your debt. God doesn't owe you and I salvation because we've paid something to Him for it. He'll never count our salvation as something He owes us but he gives it as a gift of his grace and it's free of our work. Sure, we want people to serve the Lord. I want to do all the good works I can, but not to be saved. It's because I already am saved and I want to show my thanksgiving to the great God who saved me on his account and not mine. Verse number five says, but to him that worketh not, 
But believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. So you see, the confusion goes away about how everlasting salvation is going to be once we understand how we get salvation in the beginning, and that's by faith. So if I put my faith in Jesus, he gives me his righteousness, and I have everlasting life because I'm righteous in God's eyes, and that is not going to be changed ever. Here's the second example. It's David, and it's right here where we are in Romans chapter 4. Verse number 6 speaks of David. Here we go. Even as David also described the blessedness of the man, unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works. David knew this truth too. Way back, a thousand years before there was Jesus dying on a cross, David knew he was saved because of his faith in a salvation that God was going to provide. And when David believed in the Lord, like Abraham did, that faith was counted to him for righteousness and the righteousness of God, it says here, was imputed to David. And this is a great word, imputed. Let me give you the Greek word. It's very interesting. It's a word, logizomai. And it's a word that in, in the English today might be inventoried. It means it was accounted to him. It means something has been added to your bank account. Something was added to the shelves in your library. You got something now inventoried unto you. What? Righteousness of God. How? By faith alone in Christ alone. And so David, even in his almost unspeakable sin of adultery, lying, and even murder, his salvation was not at stake. His salvation was not in a life of best behavior. No, no. His salvation was in his faith alone in Christ. And in the darkest days of his life when David was crying his eyes out and bleeding his heart to God in prayer, David didn't have to doubt his salvation. He knew that was forever because he'd been given the righteousness of God in Christ. It was imputed to him. It was added to his account for a gift, for free, because he believed in the Lord. Here's another great Bible verse, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 21 says, For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin. That's Jesus. He knew no sin. But he was made to be sin for us. Our sin was put into his inventory. It was imputed to him. Jesus took our sin. Jesus added that sin to his store. And then he dealt with it at the cross. The rest of the verse says that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. You see, friend, we don't have to approach our salvation thinking that we need to build our own righteousness. You can't know you're saved if you embrace that. You can't know that you'll be saved in the end. Here's why. Because though you might think you're the best person in the world today, you haven't lived tomorrow yet. Or what might you look like 10 years from now? As long as we think we must pull some righteous work off on our own before we can be saved, we only have confusion and a lack of clarity in our biblical understanding of salvation. It's forever because it's based in Jesus Christ and he can never, ever fail. His payment for sin was death and he paid it to the full and it'll never be paid or added to again. Amen. I'm excited about this. That's what made me a preacher. I know I'm saved, not because I'm a good guy or trying to be a good guy. I'm saved by faith alone in Jesus Christ and it is mine forever. Our third character today is Nicodemus. Nicodemus, the most famous verse in the Bible. In John 3, 16, he was told that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Amen. So what did Jesus tell Nicodemus to do to be saved into eternal life? One thing. One, not two, not anymore. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. Now, there might be an objector 
Waving a famous Bible verse, subjecting, but friend, Abraham didn't have your Bible verse. David didn't have that verse when God imputed righteousness to the both of them by faith alone in Jesus. Nicodemus didn't have your verse. What they were told was to believe and what they were promised was everlasting life and the same thing is still true.